The crypto market has seen a flash crash starting with Ethereum over the last 48 hours. Frank Holmes, executive chairman of Hive Blockchain Technologies and CEO of U.S. Global Investors, is back to talk all things. Now, people are concerned that Bitcoin and Ethereum has fallen off their highs. But when you look at the price, it's, it's, it's still very high, right? It's still, you know, should people be worried at this point? No, I, I think we've seen this incredible volatility when something is disruptive. Think about Tesla. Tesla has the same DNA volatility as Bitcoin and Ethereum. Yeah. In fact, Ethereum is more volatile than Bitcoin, like silver is more volatile than gold. But whenever something is disrupt disruptive and it's like digital money is coming into the market stream and in full throttle this past year, uh, it's going to have all these naysayers and early adopters so we have seen now the gold market you know come through a correction here and everyone's focused on ethereum and bitcoin i say that the both are incredible alternative asset classes but this flash cash crash in ethereum happened a little over a year ago when ethereum surged to 300 fell to 100 came right back up to 200 and sort of went sideways before it went on to these other levels Okay. Now, let's talk about Bitcoin and Ethereum now. You've, I know you've done a lot of research on the relationship between these two cryptocurrencies. I'm looking at the Ethereum to Bitcoin chart as a ratio. It spiked earlier in the year with Ethereum going way up, and now it's actually coming back down to historical averages. So it's more or less normalized to the average. From here, I, do, do you see Ethereum's continue to outperform Bitcoin? I do because they're ve they're very different, David. Uh, you've got to look at the industrial. So when we talk about silver, it has much bigger industrial footprint because of solar panels. Well, when it comes to Ethereum, it's a smart contract. So when you hear about JP Morgan stable coin or other people coming with these stable coins, they basically are using Ethereum algorithm. That is a pent up demand. And now we have this explosion in decentralized finance known as DeFi. Uh, last year grew by 20 billion. I think in the first month of this year, it was 30 billion. Uh, mm -hmm. It's all in the backbone of Ethereum. So Ethereum is a unique animal in its own way. It's the second biggest market cap and most liquid cryptocurrency. But I think Bitcoin is like the collector's item. It's like for me at the Andy Warhol original paintings. Uh, it's going to go up in value as more people come in and buy it. They can buy in fractals. Uh, and we are seeing that and what's called Metcalf's Law. Yeah. Metcalf's Law explains why you're seeing this rise in crypto. It's, it's very interesting that you compared it to an Andy Warhol a piece of work. And uh, I had this discussion with an analyst last week about the valuations of cryptocurrencies. And the conclusion was that, look, it's very difficult to value something that doesn't generate any cash flow. It's ultimately based on, on market perception. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. If you think Andy Warhol is worthless, you're going to pay zero dollars for it. Likewise, if you think Bitcoin is worthless, you're going to pay zero dollars for it. So why is Bitcoin worth forty eight thousand dollars in the eyes of the beholder, so to speak? Can you can you give it a give an explanation? And, and Bill Gates, uh, one of the richest men in the world, doesn't buy Andy Warhols and he doesn't like Bitcoin. So what does that mean? Uh, whereas friends of mine have bought the prints for ten thousand dollars. I've seen them their mouth go up to a quarter million dollars. So, you know, I, I don't want to get into that our, our base, what's good or bad. If you like Warhol art uh, and Metcalf's law will prevail there, too. So let's that's I think it's just a, a, a side story. What's really important. And we saw this happen last year in GameStop. All these kids that have been playing those games and playing war games and Internet games, they've been being rewarded in digital money in that in that game. They have their own digital currency, like Monopoly money. And if you're really good, you got big bonuses and you could upgrade and buy more software. Well, we have all these Generation X and Millennials that are used to going to GameStop to buy the equipment or they've been going on the Internet. They're very quick to buy into the concept of digital money, DeFi finance, because they're used to it. Uh, and I think that when we heard all this drama over GameStop, well, all these kids that were trading the stock were also buyers, just like people that bought Starbucks, went to bought Starbucks coffee every day. Yeah. Uh, when, when you look at Satoshi's white paper, the origins of Bitcoin and the original protocols for Bitcoin, were you surprised that it's become more of an asset for speculation over time? 
Well, I don't think so. I, I think it's really is a remarkable piece of engineering. But really, it's on the backbone of telecom. Um, blockchain really came out in the early 90s before the internet was released. And it's because the banks actually are the biggest movers of money, not. It's telecom companies that do all the wiring between. And then the idea was, could they create a blockchain, a ledger, this open ledger to be able to track everything? This concept that Satoshi basically took was already there and polished it up to create decentralized finance as just the same as a lot of gold bugs don't like central banks printing all this money, practicing MMT, uh, the new world, the new millennials, et cetera, were addicted to this digital world. And that's why it grew. And we can see this past year, uh, what happened when the supply halved for, for uh, Bitcoin. Uh, and that only uh, took six months and all of a sudden prices doubled and tripled. So I remain very bullish, but they're gonna be extremely volatile. Uh, does that what you just said? It's a it's a great bullish case. Does that at all concern you in any way that it's mo it's mainly driven by younger investors, like you said, hurting into the space? No, because they can speculate. They're a young person. It's my age that should be careful of a great speculation. A younger person, uh, they've got 40, 50 years in front of them. Uh, as you get older, you should tone down your speculation. And one of the reasons I was trying to launch an ETF in the space and I wasn't going nowhere. So that was the whole creation of the concept when I got invited to participate and became a principal co-founder yeah. of, of high blockchain technology, which was the first public company mining Ethereum and then Bitcoin in the Canadian capital markets. And it attracted a billion dollars of US uh, money managers going into Canada to participate in other blockchain companies. Yeah. Well, you have some good news to talk to share with us about Hive, but just a minute now. Uh, last question about the uh, the markets. The uh, you mentioned that these uh, these kids are speculating. Well, when they get older, Frank, um, w when they become close to retirement age and they don't want to speculate in volatile assets anymore, would they be dumping their Bitcoin and Ethereum and then and then you know the biggest holders are now are, w w would then would then uh, you know release them into the markets and we'll have a big sell off. I don't know. It's it's like asking me, you know, when the internet first came out, is ask Jeeves, is he still going to be around? <laughs> He's history. You know, it, it evolved, and then Google, and then Yahoo was first, and then Google turned around and basically, as they like to say, Uberized uh, Yahoo. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that it's it's early innings sure. uh, in this digital world, and I think it's only going to grow. It's yeah. going to remain extremely volatile. Yeah. Uh, we saw that now on PayPal, you can buy Bitcoin. Uh, if you go to um, uh, some of these websites in particular in stocks, uh, you can go to Robinhood and you can buy Bitcoin. So it's a big game changer what's going on in the capital markets. Okay, now Hive, let's talk about Hive now. It was named 2020's most liquid TSX listed stock. Uh, can you, I'll, I'll let you explain the good news here. What, what does that mean? I think, David, when I first launched the high blockchain uh, as the chairman, before I became the executive chairman involved more in the running the company, uh, it, it was it, to me, it was fascinating to watch the sort of journey of how it attracted so many gold investors who were reluctant to go on one of these crypto exchanges, fearful of hackers, and they use Hive as a proxy. And Hive was and has been an, a phenomenal proxy. It went up from 30 cents from the seed financing all the way up to six dollars and as the winter took place for the crypto space and bitcoin went from 19,000 to 3,000 high fell 90 yeah. percent uh high was turned around and made new highs and is basically as a proxy and has traded to over two billion shares when and in the u.s on the over-the-counter market it was the fourth most liquid stock on the over-the-counter market, it traded almost a half a billion shares. So it is becoming, it moves by the hour. It's up by the hour, Ethereum, Bitcoin are up, and if they fall, roll over, it goes down. So quant funds are also using Hive as a proxy for this space. Uh, Hive is the only public company that is mining both Ethereum and Bitcoin. And this is important strategic difference is that last year, Bitcoin was up about 300%, Ethereum was up 475%, and Hive just exploded up 
So Hive is, was, has been the most profitable so far crypto mining company. Uh, when you take a look at all these other companies in the US and Canada, and uh, the future is how many more, how much more equipment can you get? We're seeing a huge shortfall. There's no more equipment, just like there's no chips for, for car companies and they're having a difficulty yeah. uh, with GPU chips. We're seeing this also for crypto. Uh, I'd like to get a bit of your history here now, um, transitioning into the crypto space. People know you as a prominent uh, figure in the precious metals and resource sector. You've written books, for example, on mining and gold, and you've worked with miners closely throughout your decades of your career. I, I wonder why you decided, OK, I've worked with precious metals miners. Now I'm going to start working with crypto miners. How, how did that transition take place? Can you walk us through the rationale there? couple things. One, when the CEO of Fidelity uh, goes to a crypto conference, which people are spending $2,000 to attend, and it's sold out, and she has her CFA, Abigail Johnson, and she does not go to investment conferences. So here is this person speaking at a crypto event for a couple of years in a row. She's been doing her own Bitcoin mining uh, long before all of a sudden it got it became mainstream. That was a big wake up call of looking for the future. Uh, and, and I think the other part was the ecosystem, they like to call it. There was 10,000 nodes for Bitcoin and Ethereum had 30,000 scientists around the world in this ecosystem talking about this being the future. There are not 30,000 engineers talking about gold mining and investing in the ecosystem and nodes around the world. So uh, that really impressed me about the depth and breadth that just under, uh, which was basically invisible to the securities market had grown. Okay, so what were the major challenges for you then setting up a crypto miner? I mean, I, 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 I'd imagine that it's a very different business model than a resource, a physical asset miner, like a gold miner or a silver miner. Well, you buy equipment. Uh, you, uh, we only use green energy. It's been very, very significant, high ESG footprint. Uh, we're mining in Sweden and Iceland and in, in Quebec and shortly here uh, in New Brunswick. Uh, and it's all green energy. So that was a key component difference. Uh, some of these other miners are using coal. Uh, and I think the other part was in, in this sort of looking at it, we have to buy equipment just like you produce gold. We use green energy and we do the, use the technology to be mined in the cloud. So we are mining a commercial asset that we can sell. It goes 24-7. Uh, it's a phenomenal uh, a volatility, also in your profit margins. So you can have this incredible swings in your gross margins. Right now, we're experiencing 90% gross profit margins in mining Ethereum. Even at 1,500, uh, we're corrected from 2,000 range. So I think that this is a phenomenal industry and there's going to be many new derivatives to come from it and it has nothing but lots of blue sky, but extremely volatile. Yeah, I'd like to understand the uh, mining industry a little bit more in terms of the crypto space, not, not uh, gold mining. But drawing parallels to the gold mining space, do you think the crypto miners are facing some of the same challenges like the gold miners are? Gold miners are running out of reserves, the exploration companies, the, dep the economic deposits, as you know, are drying up around the world. Similarly for crypto, uh, if you take a look at Bitcoin, for example, there's only 21 million Bitcoins available to be mined. Around 18.5 million have already been mined. So are, are crypto miners running out of reserves, so to speak? Well, definitely when you look at Bitcoin in particular, with this having taking place every four years, uh, and a finite number of Bitcoins will be ever produced. Uh, and with, understand it, David, every 10 minutes, it's a drop puck. Yeah. And all of these miners around the world go in to get the chance to validate that, that transaction. And if they do, they earn 6.25 new Bitcoins. And it's extremely competitive. So you have to have the fastest technology. Sure. And to survive the downdrafts, you have to have the cheapest electricity or you're going to have a great difficulty. So there are many pockets of electricity that are stranded. And, and so this whole exaggeration that uh, Bitcoin is using up all the world's electricity, et cetera, it's greatly mis uh, disinformation, just like gold is, is so bad as an asset class by environmentalists. Um, I, I think that we're going to see these data centers become very valuable because we're all zooming it now or using these other service providers 
COVID was a big game changer for how people would conduct themselves for learning in school, for business transactions, et cetera. So you're gonna need more and more of these data centers. You need them for rendering. You want smart cities. Our GPU chips then can be used to look at everyone in a city with cameras and be able to see who's not paid their parking tickets. Uh, this is going to happen. This is in New Zealand right now. Uh, it's definitely in the UK and it's going to continue to grow. Yeah. Do you think, is it true that that it becomes harder and harder to mine a crypto uh, as less of it is available to be mined? You need more energy, more resources per, per coin after that? You don't need so much the more energy. You need better computer systems uh, and, and faster. So the uh, S19s by Bitmain, uh, the Super Pros, and they have all these new names coming out, like the BMWs and Mercedes, new series of cars. Uh, but what's important here is, is, is that you have to get this new technology, but there's a shortage, and the shortage is not going away. These companies are sold out. A Taiwan Semiconductor is no longer going to give the ASIC chip manufacturer more uh, chips to be able to manufacture the, these uh, uh, miners. So we're going to see a real supply side uh, shrinkage. So therefore, mm -hmm. the interest people competing for mining those Bitcoins are going to drop off. All right. Now, looking ahead now, Frank, uh, for the crypto miners, where is the future for crypto miners? What kinds of coins should they be focusing on for the highest margins uh, to meet the biggest demand? What, what are the what are the what are the coins? What are the sectors you would be paying attention to? For us, it's been Bitcoin and, and Ethereum. Uh, we announced today that we've expanded our footprint. That we're pushing for two thousand petahash. Uh, we're almost there. Uh, we made that to get up our ASICs because we are the biggest uh, GPU miner for mining Ethereum in the world. Now, there's many other coins. Uh, we've gone back and forth through the Ethereum Classic, etc. But the issue is that we're so big that all of a sudden we could be too big of a player in that coin. So we really just want to stay focused on Ethereum, uh, which we think has a three-year window of huge opportunities on the upside and Bitcoin mining. I know that um, physical miners have all the sustaining costs. For example, gold miners, typically that's around 800 to $1,000. They're, they're all in sustaining costs. Is there, is there a floor for Bitcoin and Ethereum price for you? Uh, if it hits below that floor, it becomes unprofitable to mine? Well, it depends what technology. If you got your S9s on right now, they're profitable. Uh, but as soon as it falls below 15,000, you're no longer profitable. Sure. Uh, and you're going to need S19s really to, to be able to stay ahead of the game. Um, but uh, I, I think it, you have to have the cheap electricity. You have to have the new, tech, the new chips that are out there. And there's a shortage of them. So it's a very bullish scenario for crypto mining. It's a very profitable business if you can have access to these chips and you have transparency. Now, there's a couple of new guys coming in to knock off Hive success, et cetera, uh, but they're not Hive. And, uh, and I think that investors out there have to be very, very conscientious on transparency because that's something that's been a big issue for me in the whole Hive, Hive blockchain experience. Uh, they have to make sure the track record of these people, that they believe in good corporate governance, uh, that they do believe in the green energy, uh, these are important factors because a lot of them don't.